All right, welcome to today's lesson on Swing. We're going to be learning how to make a basic graphical user interface using the simple components that we can find in the Swing package. So what is Swing? Well, Swing is a programming package that we can import into our programs just like the becker.robots package we've already been using. And what this one does is it makes the creation of graphical user interfaces easier. In order to do this, we have to import the javax.swing.star package at the beginning of our program. And we may possibly need to use others depending on what we're trying to do, but for today's lesson, this should be the only package that we require. Now, Swing is basically an alternative to using AWT, which is known as the Abstract Windowing Toolkit. This is the older method that was used in order to be able to create graphical user interfaces. And there are some distinct differences between the two packages. The biggest one is that Swing is platform independent, while AWT is not. What this means is that all objects we create in Swing will have the same appearance regardless of which platform they're used on. So a checkbox in a Mac looks the same as it does on a PC, which looks the same as it does on a Linux. And this is because Swing packages contain all the code we need to implement the graphic user interface. So whenever we want to create a checkbox, the code on how that is going to look is written directly in a Swing package. Whereas in AWT, it uses the operating system's windowing toolkit, which will allow it to create components which are specific to that particular platform. So it uses the Mac windowing toolkit to make Mac looking components, and it makes a PC windowing toolkit to make PC looking components. So everything will have a slight distinct feel based on the user uh, operating system that's on that particular computer. In addition, Swing also provides some more advanced components that are not available in the AWT package. These are things like tabbed panels or the ability to have scrolling panes, tables, and so on. So. The first thing we need to know is that we have something called a J-frame. This is the basic part of your GUI, and it looks like that picture on the side here. The advantage of having a J-frame is that it's already pre-coded with several features. So you can see that when we have a J-frame, we have these little boxes that are already coded for us. Things like closing the window, maximizing, minim minimizing, resizing, we can grab on the corners and make it bigger, smaller. All the things that we can typically do with a particular window on our graphical user interface. And then all the components that we're going to create are going to be contained inside of this J-frame. So in order to make a J-frame, you have to call its constructor, just like we did when we were working through robots. We had to construct a robot, a wall, a thing, and so on. So in this case, we have to make the constructor for a J-frame. And it looks like this. So again, this would be the type of object we're creating. You must give it a name. So in this case, it's going to be my main J-frame because it's going to be my main window. And then we do the same sort of new J frame. So these must match. This here must match the type of object over here. And we don't have to have any parameters in order to create it. This particular constructor will create a basic J frame with the following initial attributes. So there'll be no title. The frame will not actually be visible until we run a method that is going to make it visible. And when you click on that little close box, that little X in the top corner, instead of actually exiting out of the program, all it's going to do is hide the frame. And again, we can change that um, with a method that we'll see later on. So here are some of the services that are available to any JFrame that we create. So the first one is set title, which allows you to put a title into the window that you're working with. Set default close operation. In this case, you have to type JFrame dot and then pick one of four different options on what you want a J-frame to do when you click on that little X box in the top corner. So as I said earlier, the initial default is to hide on close. You could also have exit on close, so when you click that X box, the whole program terminates. Dispose on close, which just gets rid of that window and has the rest of the program running, and do nothing on close, which essentially just makes that little X do nothing. So when you click on it, nothing happens. You've got a set location method where you provide it with two values, x and y, x being the uh, width or horizontal and y being the vertical. And that's going to be where the top left hand corner of the window is going to be on your screen when it runs. So you can position where you want that window open up when you run the program. We've got set size where you provide it two integers, this time being the width and the height, and tells you how big 
your window is going to be. And a method called pack, which is going to set the size of the frame based on how big each component is that is in the frame itself. And finally, we have set visible, which is going to allow the frame to either be true, visible, or false, not visible. And again, the default would for it to be false, not visible. So now we've got our, our frame created. We need to add some components to it. So the components we're going to add are things like buttons, text boxes, text areas, labels, and so on. Okay? These are done by creating J components objects. And here are the variety of some of the J components we have available to us. In order to add a J component to your J frame, you have to do two steps. First of all, you have to initialize the component itself. This is basically done the same way regardless of the component you're working with. Now there are multiple constructors for some of these components that can have uh, different preferences or parameters put into these brackets, but for the most part they all have a default constructor that have no parameters required. So again, the type what we're going to create, the name of that object is a new type of the object we're going to create, etc, etc. Once you've initialized the component, you can now add that component to your frame. This requires the use of something called a content pane, which is part of your JFrame. This content pane is going to allow the programmer to control how the components are displayed relative to each other. So in other words, what order each component is going to be on your screen. To do this, you first have to create a JPanel that is going to be used to hold all the other components. So essentially think of it as a little box where you're going to put everything in it and then that box gets displayed in your window. You're going to add each component to that panel that you've created using the code here, the name of the JPanel, whatever you've called it, dot add, and then provide it with the component you want to place into that panel. Doing this will add your components in order, so whatever order you put these commands in, going from left to right across the screen, and then when that left to right is finished, it goes from top to bottom, so kind of like reading a book. When there's no more room, it goes to the next line, adds the next component, next component, and so on. Once you've added all your components to that panel, you then set the panel as a JFrames content pane using this line of code. So again, the name of your frame here, dot set content pane, and then provide it the name of the panel that you want to have as the content pane for this particular frame. Some of the services that are available, well first of all, each component has specialized service based, based on what that component is supposed to do. If you want to know more about those specific services, we'll talk about them a little bit later on, or you can research them by looking at the Java docs for each particular component. But there are some services that are common to all components, and are basic ones that we're going to be using today to help us design our GUIs. So here are the following. So we've got set enabled, which allows you to have the component enabled or interactable, so it can actually do something. You can set the text of that particular component. You can do something called set the preferred size. So this is going to allow you to decide how big you want your component to be, so how wide, how tall. To do that, you have to make a dimension object. So dimension, so new dimension, give it a width and a height, and then that'll be your preferred size of that particular component. And then finally, you can decide whether that particular component is visible or not visible within your actual window. And then finally, we've got one called repaint, which is going to allow you to redisplay uh, a component on the screen after something's been modified. And we'll talk about this a little bit later on in a future lesson. Okay, you may now want to check out the example that I'm going to show you, uh, which will show you an example simple GUI using the stuff that we've learned today.